Hey folks, and welcome to the second lecture video for Unit 8 on aquatic and terrestrial pollution. Today we're going to zoom in on a type of aquatic pollution that we've been talking about since the very first days of school, uh, something called eutrophication. And we'll discuss what it is, what causes it, what its impacts are, and don't you worry, we're going to look at some very, very cool graphs. But you could see some eutrophication going on here in the background. Uh, with the compare these bodies of water, this one kind of looks nice and blue, and this one is a very, very uh, sort of lime green. That's, uh, that's eutrophication. So eutrophication is Greek for well-nourished, uh, and it occurs when a body of water is saturated, totally enriched, perhaps super saturated with nutrients being uh, not the whey protein that you're using after the gym to get totally swole, but things like nitrogen and phosphorus, which are essential nutrients for plant growth and for um, development of, of, of any uh, organism, really, um, come from a variety of sources. Uh, remember that in saltwater ecosystems, nitrogen is limited, and in freshwater systems, phosphorus is limited. So when you introduce those two things, that's going to mean that uh, you result in some um, pretty sub substantial changes when you introduce excess amounts of a limited resource, right? So how does it happen? Those excess nutrients promote an algal bloom. Like I said, phosphorus is limited in freshwater ecosystems, so suddenly if you dump a lot of a limited resource in, you're going to see some big change, most notably a lot of growth. And the organisms that are going to grow first are organisms that are probably are selected or, um, you know, uh, quick colonizers who've got, um, you know, sort of weedy um, type, uh, type 3 survivorship curves. Uh, and weedy strategies where they will reproduce very, very fast and colonize very quickly, and that's algae. Uh, these sources of nutrients can come from runoff from industry, from agriculture, from the suburbs, from golf courses, uh, but it can also be from the release of uh, wastewater or sewage water, uh, which whether or not it's been treated. Um, and eventually what's going to happen is whether due to overcompetition, overcrowding, uh, lack of access to sunlight, or the nutrients start to die off a or run out a little bit, uh, the algae will start to die. And when organisms die, they sink, first of all, and then after they sink, they get decomposed uh, by uh, various microbes and decomposers at the bottom at the, in the benthic zone. And decomposition, as we know, is a combustion reaction, which requires organic matter, that's the algae, uh, will be combusted in the presence of oxygen, producing CO2 and water. And the issue with this is that it's actually, this reaction uh, is going to demand a lot of oxygen, because we've got a lot of algae that is suddenly being decomposed at a very fast rate. So that is going to increase the biological oxygen demand in this area at this time. So an increase in biological oxygen demand is going to mean a decrease in the amount of oxygen that's dissolved in the water. And this is a problem for any organism that relies on oxygen, meaning pretty much all of them. Uh, plants rely on oxygen to do cellular respiration, uh, you know, and organisms like fish and humans breathe oxygen. And this is going to lead to conditions called hypoxia. A hypoxic ecosystem is one that has extremely low concentrations of dissolved oxygen. And in humans, hypoxia can lead to brain damage, organ failure, all sorts of bad stuff. Um, and that, is, um, that holds true for other organisms as well. So hypoxic conditions are really, really bad for an ecosystem and ultimately are going to result in the die-off of a lot of uh, um, organisms that, that aren't able to tolerate low oxygen conditions. So medium to large size fish, um, and um, you know any mammals living in that ecosystem, etc. So the ecosystem will, will quickly become a wasteland. Here's a diagram showing that same process. Uh, nitrogen and phosphorus are injected or introduced into the ecosystem, which causes uh, phytoplankton to start growing, eventually leading to an algal bloom, which uh, interestingly can actually block sunlight from reaching other plants. But once it dies, uh, the algae will sink to the bottom and it will start to decay, which requires oxygen and will lower the amount of oxygen in the water, reducing the available habitat, reducing food because it's blocking uh, or outcompeting other plant species, uh, so ultimately um, causing the ecosystem to collapse. And uh, this doesn't just happen in lakes or wetlands, marshes, mangroves, or streams. It can happen in the ocean, too, uh, creating massive, massive dead zones. Here's an example of the Mississippi River watershed. You can see it's extremely large, stretching from uh, just west or just east of the Rockies all the way to just east of the Appalachian Mountains. Um, so all of the water that is collected in this area is going to filter down through the Mississippi River and get deposited in the Gulf of Mexico right by Louisiana and Houston. Um, and you can see there are a lot of cities like Chicago and a lot of farms that are probably producing a lot of runoff, uh, 
uh, which can lead to these dead zones, these hypoxic zones off the coast. Uh, you can see here it's totally black, um, and you can see all of this sediment and all this algae, all of this uh, nutrient pollution going on there, and it can result in some pretty depressing, um, you know, um, I'm not even sure what to call this, some sort of desert of death, uh, undersea death desert. Uh, it's pretty bad. It, they, actually, let's call it a dead zone because that's what it's called. Um, and there are dead zones located around the world, not just in the Gulf of Mexico, but on the east coast of the United States, northern Europe and Scandinavia, and as well around South Korea and Japan. They are dead zones found. <clears throat> Excuse me. Here's a diagram showing different sources of the nutrient pollution. Uh, it can come from sewage, whether it's treated or not, that can introduce nitrogen and phosphorus. Laundry detergents that run off uh, can introduce phosphorus. A lot of laundry detergents are made from phosphates, although there have been some bans that have reduced the amount of phosphates in detergent. Uh, the actually, believe it or not, the combustion of fossil fuels that releases nitrogen oxides, those nitrogen oxides can dissolve into lake water and introduce um, nitrogen. That's not as big a source, but it can happen. Of course, there's fertilizer and manure from um, concentrated animal feeding or organizations um, like CAFOs, feedlots, right? Um, these can inject or uh, introduce large amounts of nitrogen and phosphorus into the ecosystem. Runoff from parking lots and urban areas can do the same thing. So there's a lot of different sources. All of these, for the most part, are non-point so sources. I guess maybe if you've got a pipe uh, of, of wastewater being dumped right in, that could be a point source of pollution, but a lot of this is going to be non-point sources of pollution. So if you look at this diagram, a eutrophic lake has got a lot of algae, it's kind of green, a lot of decomposed matter at the bottom, um, no big fish. The opposite end of that spectrum is something called an oligotrophic lake, uh, which is a much, much healthier ecosystem. So an oligotrophic lake uh, uh, has low nutrients, uh, higher dissolved oxygen, low turbidity, meaning the water is very clear, sunlight can penetrate through. It's got bigger fish, uh, stable algae populations, uh, probably more robust food chains in general. This is the kind of lake that you want to swim in. As opposed to a eutrophic lake, you do not want to be swimming in this lake, unless maybe there's something wrong with you. I don't know. It's got low dissolved oxygen, high turbidity, sunlight cannot penetrate through, so plants are not able to photosynthesize, high nutrient content, uh, totally hypoxic, right? Uh, less big fish, lots of algae, unstable nutrient or unstable trophic, um, trophic webs. Uh, so this is a very unhealthy ecosystem. Now, when these microbes are digesting dead algae in an eutrophic ecosystem, they need oxygen, right? We've already discussed decomposition as a combustion reaction that requires oxygen. It's a lot like cellular respiration. And this decomposition is going to increase biological oxygen demand. When biological oxygen demand is low, the water quality is very good. And you can see as BOD increases, the quality of the water it becomes more and more polluted, right? Because there's more and more organic waste present, and there's less and less oxygen for organisms to utilize. So let's think about this a little bit. These three questions here. Where is biological oxygen demand the highest? Where is there lots of decomposition? And where are large algal blooms found? So let's go in sequence. Where is BOD the highest? Well, it's going to be the highest in areas with lots of decomposition. Okay, and so where are, is there, where are, where are areas of uh, uh, high decomposition rates? Areas with large algal blooms. They need something to decompose. And where are areas with large algal blooms? Well, those are going to be found near sources of nutrient pollution. Right? This is exactly what we were just talking about. So what that means is that as we, as we get further and further from the source of the pollution, the biological oxygen demand will increase. Or uh, as I state here, as distance from the pollution source increases, biological oxygen demand decreases. And therefore, dissolved oxygen will increase. This relationship can be graphed into something called the oxygen sag curve. It's a very, very cool graph. Uh, so let me, let me uh, paint a picture for you here and show you my PowerPoint art skills. It's my favorite art medium, and I think it's uh, wildly unappreciated. So we've got a river. Look at this beautiful river. Oh, I'd go swimming in this river. It's flowing in this situation from west to east. Okay. Unfortunately, there's a pipe there, a point source of pollution that is discharging nutrients. Maybe it's sewage. Maybe it's fertilizer runoff into the water. And because of uh, diffusion, the nutrient concentration is going to be highest here, and as it moves down the river, it's going to diffuse throughout the water and become less concentrated. 
Okay, that means that these nutrients are going to lead to an algal bloom, and the more nutrients, the more algal bloom we get. So in this case, over here, we're going to have a lot of algae, and down here, not as much. So you can see that represented by these uh, beautiful little shapes I've got here. A very dense algal bloom, a very uh, much lower dense algal bloom. Right? Ultimately, what these algae are going to do, they're going to die and they're going to decompose. Right? So let's take a look at the biological oxygen demand, which is going to relate to this decomposition. Um, and this graph, the distance from pollution source is a one-to-one -one for this picture here. Right? So uh, here we're upstream of the point source of pollution. Here we're at the source of the point, uh, or the, at the point source of pollution. And here is downstream of the point source of pollution. And uh, if we look upstream, biological oxygen demand is very low. There's no algae, so there's no decomposition. So there's low biological oxygen demand. But once we hit the source, biological oxygen demand is going to spike. It's going to spike because there's lots of algae that are going to decompose, and that decomposition requires oxygen, so there's a high demand for it. As we move away, though, that biological oxygen demand will start to shrink because there's less and less algae, and therefore less and less decomposition. Okay, now let's take a look at dissolved oxygen, right, which is going to have a somewhat opposite relationship to this red line here, right? Upstream, there's low biological oxygen demand, so there's going to be high dissolved oxygen. Once we hit the point source of pollution, biological oxygen demand increases, so the amount of oxygen in the water is going to drop substantially, right, uh, because of all that uh, decomposition. But as we move further and further away from the point source, there's less and less decomposition, less and less biological oxygen demand, so the dissolved oxygen will actually start to bump up again. This is the oxygen sag curve, and it's called such because it's a graph of oxygen, uh, or a curve of oxygen that sags in the middle, right? so the oxygen sag curve. Uh, we can break this up into a couple different locations. Uh, this is uh, clean water upstream of the point source. Right at the point source is the decomposition zone. This is only going to be inhabited by uh, organisms that can tolerate pollution and tolerate uh, hypoxic conditions. The septic zone uh, is, there's not really going to be any life here at all. Totally hypoxic, nothing can really survive. You can see the amount of dissolved oxygen present is so, so low. Uh, and as we start to move further down, we get into the recovery zone, which is kind of similar to the decomposition zone, and that organisms that can tolerate pollutants and a little bit of hypoxia will survive, and then further downstream is completely clean water. Okay? I would be very familiar with this graph. So let's look at a couple other examples. Here's the same thing. Uh, um, not quite as fancy as my drawing, I think, uh, but it's pretty good, I would say. I mean, there's a couple things they could work on, but you know, we won't get into that. Um, so you can see biological oxygen demand in red. Uh, it's pretty low, and then once you hit the point source of pollution, it spikes up and then sags as you get further and further away. Uh, and if we look at dissolved oxygen, it's pretty high, and then uh, once the decomposition starts, it starts to decrease. It's the lowest in the septic zone, starts to recover uh, until you get further downstream. Here's another diagram showing the same thing. This one's not 3D. Uh, one thing I like about this is it shows the point source of pollution. It shows you the density of nutrient pollution. So you can see in the decomposition zone, it's very dense, but it's not covering the whole exact uh, area. Whereas in the septic zone, it's, it's still pretty dense. It's covering the whole area. The recovery zone, it's not as dense. And in the clean zone, it's not really that dense at all. Uh, so that helps explain some of these patterns that we see. Uh, so what can you do to help reduce eutrophication? Uh, it's pretty straightforward. One, uh, if you're using dishwashing or laundry detergent, make sure it's low phosphate or no phosphates. If you're washing your car, do it at a car wash. They've got special drains to collect everything, not on the driveway where it'll run off into a sewage drain and get deposited into uh, you know, nearby a water source or aquatic ecosystem. Plant rain gardens help promote the protection of wetlands. Uh, build buffer strips alongside farms to help reduce the amount of nutrient pollution that is ending up into these rivers. So, I mean, the big thing that we can do is help preserve and restore wetland ecosystems. You know, something crazy like 90% of all Earth's wetlands have been destroyed or modified, uh, and that's a big problem because wetlands help reduce nutrient pollution. They filter the water, they purify it, um, and they provide a wide variety of other ecosystem services as well, so they're worth protecting. Um, here's a one last diagram showing us eutrophication. Really make sure you've got this process down. Fertilizer runoff leads to algal bloom, which blo blocks the sunlight. The algae dies and decomposes, reducing oxygen, and the fish therefore suffocate. Uh, that's all I got for you today. If you've got questions, bring them to class, and I will see you then.